Um, well, good evening, everyone. And um, like I said, it's, it's really great to see such a full house on a beautiful evening. So thank you for coming out to support uh, Village Preservation and this program and our, our author, Seth, here. Um, so my name is Dina Taskwister, and I'm the Director of Research and Preservation at Village Preservation. Um, and yeah, we are, we're just so thrilled to be here tonight to hear author Seth Gorenstein discuss his new novel, Swimming to Jerusalem. Um, and I also want to extend an extra thanks to uh, the, the uh, Hudson Park Library branch of the New York Public Library for hosting us tonight. Um, so just in case some of you are new to Village Preservation and the work that we do, I wanted to briefly introduce us. Um, Village Preservation is a nonprofit organization that has been documenting, celebrating, and advocating for the preservation of architectural and cultural heritage of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. Um, part of our mission is an ongoing effort to protect the integrity of our buildings and our streetscapes, and we have secured zoning protections for nearly 100 blocks in our neighborhoods, um, and landmark designation of more than 1,200 buildings, um, actually including the very building that we're in right now, which is part of the Greenwich Village Historic District Extension 2 uh, that we helped secure protection for in 2010. Um, as a member-based organization, your support is essential to enabling us to provide free programming such as this um, and for us to continue our advocacy and preservation work in the village. Um, so do please uh, consider joining us if you're not already a member. We have some literature in the back table behind you on your way out later this evening, um, and as well as our newsletter and some other literature. Um, and you can always find us online at villagepreservation.org. Um, and do check out our website also to see what other upcoming events we have. Uh, we put on about 75 to 80 programs that are free and open to the public each year, and we cover all sorts of topics um, about Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo, uh, focusing on history, culture, small businesses, and the irreplaceable and unique built environment of our neighborhoods. Um, and just a little pitch for our September programming, uh, we're going to have a talk focusing on the East Village on September 6th, uh, featuring author Ada Calhoun. Um, and we have a few different walking tours coming up, which are always popular, um, especially our uh, hip hop tour celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop here in New York City. Um, and we also are going to be returning to this very library um, on September 20th for a fascinating lecture on the history of Greenwich Village street names and the wonky uh, neighborhood grid that we all know and love. So in just a moment, I'll turn it over to Seth, who will tell you more about himself and his work, and we will get to hear an excerpt of his novel, followed by the opportunity for some questions from the audience. I just wanted to note two last things. Um, there are copies of his book available on my left, your right here. Um, so at the end, do please feel free to purchase a copy if you're interested. They're on sale for $20 via cash or Venmo. Um, and Seth has very graciously offered to donate 25% of tonight's proceeds to Village Preservation and our work. Uh, um, but briefly about uh, Seth, he was born in Brooklyn and has spent significant time living in the village, and we'll get to hear a lot more about that. Um, he attended the Parsons School of Design and has had a career in urban economic, economic development with positions in the public, private, and academic sectors. And he has written plays, short stories, and essays, and this is his first full-length novel. Um, so Seth, thank you so very much for being here tonight, and I look forward to hearing all about your work. Thank you, Dean. Tonight, I was asked to speak about 
not to speak of programming about 45 minutes now, which is a lot, I've right? only been in six pages. So I'm dividing this up into four sections. I want to talk about how the novel came to be, because it did happen right away. And then I'll read from some of the novel, just about eight pages, double space, so it won't be too long, and I don't want to give away too much for those that have read. And then I'll talk about how the Miller influenced me. And it really did. I mean, this is the best neighbor in the world. Uh, and I've traveled a lot in the fortune in different places, but just brought me down here tonight. We lived down in midtown, and then I drove down, uh, driving in the city. It's silly and stupid, but we do it. And uh, you know, we got here, oh, we don't come down here enough. And so we always remember this is, we started out, we started going out, this is the place we lived in, and it's still a remarkable community. And then we'll just be QA. So uh, with that, I'm going to talk about how the novel came to be. Um, as Dina said, and that was like Dina Meyer and your colleague in the front is saying, come out. Chloe, thank you all so much. Um, how the novel came to be. Uh, I wrote plays. I've had a number produced in the 1980s, which nobody here has ever seen or forgot about. I think since then, I've seen sort of one or two of them. Otherwise, um, they're forget one, one of them was pretty good, but for about two seconds, they went to LA for a week to be the next Neil Simon. It never happened, but I'm great to know that. So I would do workshops, writing classes, but I love to uh, do sketches. Um, for my own job with Queens Economic Development, I write a newsletter, which has been kind of punchy and fun. And I've met some good friends that way. Vivian Myers here, who first read my newsletter 10 years ago, said, I want to meet you. And that's been your family years ago. So it's a good little newsletter, but fiction's a whole other, whole other thing. And um, I took some writing workshops in 2001, 2002, at different places, and you wrote sketches, and I always got free feedback, and it was, you know, very important to hear, have people hear what I had to say, and give me constructive criticism. Uh, I put it aside, never thought about it. COVID. I had a lot of time in my hands, as we all did. <laughs> and um, at that time, I couldn't wait for a bad leg injury. Uh, I couldn't go out of my apartment. I couldn't go out of the bedroom or kitchen, basically. It was locked in my apartment. And uh, Diane was great and fed me. Chloe and Mima took care of everything I had to do. And my daughters came over. But I tried to bake bread, and I'm terrible baking bread. I made these little French cougarines, which were misshapen, looked really weird, not very edible, but I decided to do something else. I went back to my notes of what was this idea for some characters and putting together. And before I knew it, I was working full time basically on this story, whatever it was. And I read about places I like. The story takes place in New York, Paris, Israel, all the places I've been to. So the place I've not been to, I was only never been to, I managed it. Um, but I, I write about what I know a little bit, though it's not autobiographical. Like any fiction writer, there are autobiographical elements, but it's not a story about me. My protagonist is not like me. He's a much better swimmer. <laughs> he, uh, he's musical, or something to date that, so he's just sort of loud. And uh, he likes to eat Chinese roast pork sandwiches, which anybody would ever know. They always sold in a place in Queens called Hermes International, which did, did exist on Rockway Boulevard and Peninsula Boulevard in the 1960s. I thought it was an elegant restaurant. You can only imagine a place called Hermes International steak and salad bars, not very elegant, but I thought it was good. Um, so I started writing about characters and some stories, but I didn't know where I was going. I had no plot outline or story outline. It was just one little chapter after another. And then I would sometimes say, what are you working on? I go, I don't know. So I had no idea where I was going. I read, uh, maybe maybe you heard this, John Irving, who I love, he's a great writer, always writes his last chapter first. I'm like, how can someone do that? You know, it sounds so boring, you know. It's all about the journey, not the destination, I think. And I've heard that in swimming. I've heard that in every part of life. And in writing to me, it's the same thing. It's getting there. And the different paths you take, uh, the wandering, you know, see a sudden scenery and walk a different direction than you plan, that makes life exciting. And to me, that makes writing exciting. When I was in 12th grade, there's a couple of people here who were 12th grade with me, and I had a creative writing teacher, Mrs. Rosen. And uh, she was a good teacher, 
Um, one thing about um, the class was it was an A-level class. You had to be an A-level student. I was not. I was a B-level student. He said, I don't plug it in there. And she took me into the class. And the last part of the class, the last one, I'm going to write a short story. And I wrote, I won't tell a short story. I forget the name of it, but it was a good piece. Handed it in. And she handed it out about two weeks later. And she said, I want to see you after class. You know, that's just, I was terrified. What did I do wrong? She won't let me stay in the class. Um, whole class empties out. I go by her desk. And I had to turn my paper over and see what the grade was. And I turned it over as A plus. Beautiful. And she looked at me. This is 1973. And she took out a cigarette. So, <laughs> <laughs> she, to me, she was probably 45 years old. She was elegant. And, it's really a classic teacher. And she said, Seth, you wrote a beautiful story. I love this story. And it was my first writer to writer conversation in a sense. Because Emily didn't write it, we talked about it with friends of mine. But Joan was so supportive. And she's the one that said, you develop good characters. They will tell you what they want to do. And she was right. The first bit of advice I got as a writer was let your characters drive the story. And years later, on my trip to LA, you know, which I did not become a real songwriter or screenwriter, but I did have some good times at parties in Venice Beach. Um, I did meet a screenwriter. I remember someone she telling me, you know, a good, good characters can, can carry a poor plot. A poor plot, good characters. You know, you have to have good characters to carry the plot. And uh, you need good characters. Bad characters don't carry a good plot. You've got a good, strong character. So I always worked on that. And I enjoyed working on it. Um, what's the story about? You know, in school we learned about three themes. Man versus, no, man and woman versus man and woman. Man and woman versus nature. Or man and woman versus man and woman versus himself. And I know I was thinking of that when I wrote the story, but after I finished it, I realized there are things that, I think what they say is right in school. And this is a story about man versus himself. And um, I didn't think this until I finished it and thought about it some more. But, you know, this story is, uh, man, the world can be a terrible place. Terrible things happen to us, and we do terrible things. But there's also so much joy and love in the world. We have to, it's hard to see sometimes, but we have to see it as best we can. And it takes time. And I didn't think that when I started the first book. I see it when I finish the book. I hope my readers do too. Um, in the last few months, I published in May. And uh, it was hard to get published, to be honest. I mean, it wasn't easy. I'm not, I'm not a real writer. Uh, I found a small publisher company at Oregon. And um, when I met with them on the phone, all the week Zoom, I spoke to them and they said, they said, we want to get a good, a good editor for your book. And I said, I don't want someone like me. I don't want a nerdy Jewish school intellectual <laughs> sort of smart ass. Not that so much smart ass. But I want someone very different than me. She said, I got somebody. And she uh, connected me. And I didn't need her. It was all online, uh, all nonverbal, because it wouldn't keep separation. And from what I gather, she was a, a middle-aged woman from the Northwest, a feminist, uh, possibly gay, I'm not sure, but I saw her profiles on Facebook. And I thought, this is perfect. Not Jewish, I'm sure, the way her, her name sounded in her activities. I don't think she ever went to the synagogue in her small town in Oregon. Um, and this is perfect. Someone not like me. I want someone who's not like me to read this and see if it makes sense. And I had friends read it, which was great. My friend Phil Drake, who's a great writer, was here in Blue Shirt. I'm giving you a shot. I'm he's <laughs> deserving of it. Um, he read it, and he really helped me because he said, uh, what was it because I couldn't believe you wrote it? Well, I forgot that you wrote this. It was really very, it helped me so much. He gave me confidence, and he gave me some good internal advice, uh, as other people did also. But um, Denise, the editor, got back to me after three months and gave me some great advice, uh, context, and how to make it a better piece. And she also said something, you know, when we my novel, there's a lot of references, which you have to be somewhat literate to understand. And there was a point when I wrote it, I thought maybe I should sort of dumb it down so people would get these things. And 
I said, I'm not going to do that because I'm writing for something I want to read, not for someone else. Because I'm writing for my pleasure to work. And he just got back and he said, I love reading this. I learned so much about things I didn't know. And that's what a novel is about. Right now, I'm reading this play in there, which I never read before. And it's about Spain and the Spanish Civil War, things I didn't know. And it's, that's what a novel is for, better than history books in some ways. So I'm pleased with how it turned out. And in the last few months, it's been on the market, which is Amazon. You know, love hate Amazon, but it's there. But it's available for all the bookstores in Queens, and Corner Book, John Madison, they have carried it, which I'm very pleased at. Uh, and some other bookstores around the city have carried it. And um, the feedback I'm getting is really wonderful in the sense that it's men, women, old, young, Jewish, non Jewish readers who find things I didn't find. <coughs> um, it was funny because a lot of people have read it. So oh, I love the character protagonist, Brandon, so wonderful, so wonderful. And then a friend of mine at the beach, who appreciate this, said, he's got a knucklehead potty mouth, which I love because somebody said something different to him than most people. Well, that's true, he's a knucklehead potty mouth in some ways. Um, so it's great to get the feedback. I'm so excited to be all here. I'm going to read now for about six, seven pages, double space, and not too long. And I will speak slow as my coach, Diane. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> she's right. <clears throat> and um, this is chapter uh, 16. I guess I know some people have read the book, others have not, but I want to give some context. It's a story of a young man, Graham, who's born in Paris, moved to Israel as a young child, about four or five years old, and it's at uh, 10 years old, his family up to move to Brooklyn, right beach. Um, and the story starts on South of France, 1982, 83, where he's just finished a gig as a swim instructor at a fancy hotel. And at that hotel, he's in a very depressed state. He's had a terrible experience prior to being in the hotel uh, in his time in Israel. And the hotel, the season is over. He drifts over to France, to Paris, where he busks on the Boulevard Saint Germain, uh, singing very loudly, not very good, but very loudly. And he meets Liz, who is American, uh, there on a trip with her friend. And um, they meet and they have a, it, it's just debatable who picked up who. You know, so I'm not, not sure anything that I meet with, I'm not sure who picked up who. But um, they have a relationship. Uh, they see each other six months later. And a year or two later, they moved to, he moved to their apartment on Grove Street in Grand Village, about five blocks from here where I live. For many years, they moved in where my daughters were born. And uh, I used to come to this library. Behind the library is a park and pool. I used to swim there. And this is the 1980s. And the city was a different place than any of you remember. I used to come here swimming, it was great. One morning I got here, and the pool was kind of filled with garbage. And I asked my wife about that. She said, Oh, you should see me find this pool. I had your mix and this and that. I never swam again there. So I found a different pool. But this was, it was a great neighborhood then, it still is. And Bran uh, moves into this apartment in 1984, and now in 1987. And this chapter is entitled, Only Two Parts from the Chapel. The first part is they're in their apartment on Grove Street. The chapter is called, Let's Go With Your Mind. Hurry up, Bran called in the kitchen. I have a matcha cod coaching road and a frisky puri fume. The cheeses from Murray's on Blinker. A Santa Girl Blue, a Brie, and a Comte for a sexy fromage à trois. A selection of charcuterie from the overpriced butcher and a baguette from Patricia Graziani. Give me a middle list set in the bedroom where she's cheating out of her work wardrobe. October 29, 1983 was the day they met in Paris. Graham declared it should forever be celebrated by recreating La Palais in the village apartment with expensive wine and good cheese. He wore a black t-shirt and jeans and always had a few days of stubble. Liz no longer had the dress she wore that night in Paris. Instead, she took a sexy off the shoulder top out of the closet. When Graham first moved in, she was concerned about closet space, but he traveled lightly with a wardrobe consisting of a few pairs of jeans and a of permanently wrinkled shirts. 
food to IBF and he can never swim t-shirts that he really wobbled not fall with. An extensive collection of his swimsuits hung in the shower curtain on the couch shower curtain rod and gravity states of dampness. His all collection consisted of a poster shade of error. He didn't bring many books. Contrary to the line that Jews of people the book, he told her his parents barely owned any. And he only began to read serious literature and wine. He was determined to make up for lost time and liked to wander in used bookshops, which eventually necessitated a new bookcase. She placed a few family photos on the, on the shelves and asked if he wanted to add some of his family, which made him laugh. He did buy a Ruka postcard of Medea and mm -hmm. propped up against the spine of a tattered camel paperback and said, if anyone asks, you can tell them about his mother. <laughs> the last time he saw Sophia was when he returned from Europe. It didn't go well with boyish words, and they haven't spoken since. His father sometimes called, but Graham would roll his eyes as he simultaneously did the course of the puzzle during the one side of conversations. He did visit his brother each month and knew he received letters from his uncle. Though it didn't seem to bother him, it made her sad and lack of familiar connections. We had placed the tray of cheeses and charcuterie on top of the trunk that doubled as a coffee table. We made a fire, blew in the lights, and put a Charles Asner room record on the chair table. Just like not to let loose Santa she entered the room. Minus the cigarette smokes and unbeat Frenchmen arguing over what they hate most about the Americans. <laughs> That's a cultural stereotype. <laughs> the table is no one, he said, speaking in his exaggerated French accent with hands. Frankly, just dream. Gest yet, but there is no fromage. Velveeta is not fromage. It's paste. <laughs> he exclaimed, adding dose of disgust to his delivery. He sat down in the large club chair that was left me apartment when Liz moved in. It was his favorite place to sit. With the fire blazing, he turned to Liz. I don't think I've loved the room as much as I love this room. It's perfect. He looked around as if he was seen for the first time. With his life that he was so comfortable. Her mother helped her in the apartment. Thanks to Joan's taste and wallet, it looked like it did. The wide plank wood floors were finished, and the matching wood shutters were installed on the windows. It was Joan's idea to paint, to paint the built-in bookcases old-fashioned, an old-fashioned, uh, 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 is the Jones had yet to build to paint the built-in bookcases on either side of the fireplace a robin's egg blue, which gave him a warm, old-fashioned look. The oak table and chairs was found at the antique store come junk shop down the corner of Princeton Street. When her roommate moved out and Brynn moved in, she was able to place the bed back in the bedroom and put the table near the windows. Wine? To us, and notre belle maison. Well, your beautiful home, as I had muttered into Lover. We have Graham Porter Bless and Cote de Rome. It's your home too. I only pay a third of the rent. If you only take up a quarter of the closet, it's the only way I own you. But my ego is bigger than yours, so you can zap me. <laughs> Did I ever tell you that when my father told about the houses he builds, this said, he sends a handwritten note to the buyers. How a company put a great deal of care into the building of this house, and only you will give the love that makes the home. He always told me that a house is just four walls and a roof, whether it's a chateau or a shack. It's the people inside who give it true character. We can never leave here, you know that, Graham said? Maybe if we're really, really, really nice to Sean and Randy, they'll be free to us. Not a chance. Sean's nephew is looking his clock chops over this place. Oh, well, Graham said, some fromage? He spread the Santa go blue on a piece of baguette. Your father writes notes to everyone he sells a house to? Yes. He's a smart guy. He didn't go to college. Maybe I don't either. I don't need you either. You do. Will they like me more? They already like the grant. What's not to like? I haven't got a college degree or trust fund. I'm from a screwed up family. I'm vain and self absorbed, but I do have an impressively large gram. I was going to see knowledge of literature. Yes, and that did impress my mother. You redeemed yourself that if from this day you met her and said you were reading Gabriel Garcia Marquez of Spanish because of your knowledge of Landino, how esoteric of you. Joan is very esoteric. 
Your mother and I are esoteric soulmates. I thought she'd hug you. I think she secretly wanted a French Jewish intellectual for a son. <laughs> I'm barely French. I'm more Jewish than Jewish. <laughs> Real intellectual to take who will detect my bullshit in a heartbeat. But in the tradition of great French Jewish intellectuals, I smoke like a chimney, and on occasion wear my shirts on bun to my puppet. Mm -hmm. Before you know all whiny ass, tell me, have your parents asked when we'll get married? No, they would never do that. What do you ask? We're important something with a glass of wine. Last summer at the island, when Rob introduced his, when Rob announced his engagement to Gloria, whom we adored this said, yeah, she's great. But that leaves you, the saved daughter, as the only holdout. Cliff isn't married. That's different. The world's changed. It may happen. Is this the big proposal from the guy who told me more times than I could recall that he'd never get married and certainly never have children? This gave him a provocative smile. No, of course not. Why would I do that? <laughs> well, do, you have, do you want affirmation that we'll still be together even if we don't get married and have children? She asked. No. Yes. Um, maybe. <laughs> it's just that I love my life now and I don't want it to change. I don't want it to change either, she got the glass. But you must remember everything does change. We're going to change. I agree. But not tonight. Not tonight, we said, I promise. Good. He put down his wine glass, moved in, moved to the subway, cut a love next time. It was the perfect way to celebrate the anniversary. The end of the first section of this chapter. And then a few weeks later, it's a Riviera, who remembers the Riviera Cafe on 7th Avenue? Saturday morning, and we have uh, Liz and three of her friends are sitting around for the yoga class having brunch. <clears throat> I told Jesse I don't want a cushion setting, I don't want just a cushion setting, but a cushion setting with halo, with halos. See the pave diamonds that surround it? That's what makes the cushion halo setting. It'll match the wedding band, which also has pave diamonds. Call to use your right index finger to point to the mirror in the left hand with its cushion table, whatever it's called. The other girls, we're not. Liz tried her best to focus on the discussion of having diamonds, who was going to be the wedding of the year. It found it difficult. Of the three friends she lunched with after the Saturday yoga class, Callie was the least interesting. I'm putting all of you at the same table, Callie said. Liz, what is your boyfriend's name? Mike delivered for call because she thought there was a mistake. And it's costing $4 for the place cards. I don't want to make any mistakes. Graham, Graham Goodman. Graham. I never heard a name like that. It's short for Abraham. Abraham Goodman? It sounds like one of my grandfather's poker pals in the boat. Is he Jewish? <laughs> yes. I knew it. It was turned to Tracy and Merrill. This is practically one of us. Are you sure you want to remember BBYO? I did attend one of the few moments of the congregation of Israel and played tennis with Scotch on JCC listed proudly. Well, I'm glad of a Jewish boyfriend named Abraham. They'll treat you nice and won't drink too much. Holly said she picked up a second with us. To Jewish boyfriends, except you, she pointed to Meryl. How is Officer Brian? She said the name is it for the legal substance. Mm -hmm. Brian, Meryl corrected her. Liz hadn't met Brian, though she knew Meryl's boyfriend was a former Marine who was now a police officer. Meryl met him after she came home to find her home and brutalized. And Brian was one of the officers who came to take the report. He made a point of stopping by every night the following week and parking his patrol car in front of her building. Meryl confided to Liz that her parents were not happy. Brian is fine, she said. Meryl knew that her choice of boyfriend didn't make her friends happy either. Jesse, college future husband, was on Wall Street. And Tracy's boyfriend did something in real estate. An Irish cop from Queens was not husband material in their book. Do you know what you girls should do, call a yes, but then wait for the answer. You should swap boyfriends. She pointed to them. Meryl, your mother would love you to meet somebody named Abraham Cohen. It's Graham Goodman he's taking this set with a forced smile. And you should go out with Officer Ryan. What does Abraham do? This was caught off guard. Graham teaches swimming. That's a career? She asked her question on her face. That's like a camp counselor. She turned to Meryl and patted her hand. Don't worry, your father can take me through the business. Problem solved. Carly. Carly. If Jane Austen were writing today about the upper class Jewish world of Scarsdale and the need advice, you would have been a great proficient, Meryl said. Mm -hmm. Huh? What's a proficient called, he asked. Mm -hmm. 
that's a game plan. Thank you very much for indulging me for listening to this. I really appreciate it. Um, I'd like now to talk about the village. The village preservation group is an amazing organization. Um, you know, living here when I was here, I took for granted what it was. You know, it was a great neighborhood, but I didn't understand it. I was born in Brooklyn, but raised out in Montauk, not Montauk, Montauk, which is much more low than Montauk, near, near the beach, but not as nice as the Hamptons, of course. Um, I went to school there and met great friends, some of them are here tonight. I went to Syracuse University and dropped out. Much to me that telling your Jewish parents you dropped me out of college is like, I'm a drug dealing murderer. <laughs> <laughs> it's really bad. So that August, you have no plans on what comes next. I showed the end of times with proportions of school design, Red Village. I'm going to live, this is great. I'm going to live in the village. And I applied at the end of August. Now, Parsons today is a hard tool to get into. In August 1975, if you breathe, you were accepted. <laughs> and I was able to breathe it, and I had to get a portfolio. So I got construction paper made collages of trees. It was the weakest, latest portfolio they ever saw. Maybe not, because I got in the next day. And um, I, my grandmother passed away the year before and gave me money just for college. We left money for educational purposes, not to play around. So I used it for tuition, but not for reward. I don't want it to be for my own every day. So I made friends in school, by the way. Of course, I made a play. I was in the environmental design department, which was basically, this is the 1970s. It was basically spoke marijuana and drew pictures. You know? <laughs> my kids, yeah, I got the kid. But it was that happened. It was the 1970s in the city. I know some of you were there. 1970s village was probably as close as Weimar Germany was to New York. You know, it was pretty decadent. And I tell the actor, tell the society it's so funny and so weird. When I got to Parsons, my aunt followed who was our proper member of the family, took me to a club and said, You can't go to Parsons. I said, Watch this, it's all homosexuals. <laughs> and you know what? She was right. <laughs> but it was a great time. I had a great time. I had great friends. And one of my friends, uh, we sat at tables. So there was only 40 people in the environmental design department. This is on 13th Street. And um, right across was the, it was a cafe with a lizard on top. I don't know. What's, do you remember the name now? It was in the The Lone Star. It was in the Lone Star. 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 Pine and Dotton Bookstore on Fifth Avenue, owned by two old guys, Mr. Pine and Mr. Dotton. And they would never sell you a book, go in there, like, why don't I can't buy that book? It was like, they went out of business, obviously. They wouldn't sell anything. The classic old time bookstore was on Fifth Avenue in the village. And it was this great, when I was commuting, I met, at my table was a, a, a guy by the name John Warner, that I remembers. He was a wonderful classmate. And I was the, I sort of nerdy kid from Long Island, and I came to school one day, and someone looked at my pants and said, Seth does a polyester waffle weave pants. <laughs> Never wear them again. <laughs> and I did. I had a dress in black and look cool. So, Johnson took me under his wing to be cool. He grew up in Central Park West. His family was really wealthy. I uh, forget how they made their money. They were all New York money. But his mother died, his father he married to some of his wealthy, he was. And he, the funny thing was, his parents, his father and son were thinking art. And he said, guy come to their apartment, and they lived in the barrister. He said, they have incredible, they have, their art collection is amazing. Why? They have the worst jewelry painting in the world, the worst painting, the worst cigar, the worst red shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny. Uh, but he really showed that he, he was quite wealthy, but he didn't show off. In the middle of the first couple of months of school, we had lunches, so I found this great apartment, I'm going to take it, I want you to look at it. It rents $350 a month. We were all paying like $100, friends of mine were paying $100, maybe $8 to lease the East village, $350. He had a little bit of trust, but it didn't show up, but this place is really interesting, he said. 102 Bedford Street, the Twin Peaks, for those who remember the West, the West Village, 
Twin Peaks is between Christopher and Grove. And he took me up to the apartment. It was like a bar in Vermont. It was unbelievable. And I said, he goes, he thinks take this place. I wanted to take it so I had a place to crash too, so it was, it was yeah. great. He took it and it became a clubhouse for our class. It was always the best apartment. And when you're in art school, um, you do what's called shredding. You have a project due Monday night or Tuesday morning. You sit up all night shredding, making it perfect. And John's place was the place to go to shred and drink a lot of wine and stay awake as best you can. We would have helped you stay awake. So it was a lot of fun. And we had a great time there. And it was my first introduction to the village. And from this window was a little view of Grove Street and this little house in the corner of Grove and Bedford covered with ivy. And I saw the this the most picturesque street in Grand Village. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that it was also the street that Sesame Street, the Queen of Sesame Street thought about that street and was in New Sesame Street. Um, and movies were shot there. Uh, it was a great street, still is. But I, I love that house, I really thought about it. And after college, I was living up West Side in a, in a hotel on 97. Well, it was a great SRO basically, Stephen mm -hmm. Rackett's hotel. 92nd West End, there wouldn't be a chateau. The only residents were basically young people like myself or Holocaust survivors on pension or reparations. So of course me was Milo, who was a really nice guy. Said the first of the month we got to check in Germany and went out and bought four bottles of shops for this the whole month. And then we came back in the end and we got the tales of growth in 1926 or whatever it was. It was a great place to live. I met a lot of friends there. Um, one of them, my friend Alan Steinfeld, his brothers, he had Alan's and Alan's because I'm one, he's an expert in extra trick, like extra terrestrial activities. And he's quite well known, he never showed by me a lot. He's an easy now, we have a tour of ETs and Egypt or something. But Alan said, I know, some, I know somebody knows somebody, and that's how we had promise in those days. I know somebody knows somebody who got a place on Grove Street, the guys know me now. So, uh, I'm he took me to meet somebody in his village. He said, oh, my friend lives at Grove Street. She was the landlady. So I had dinner, and I called this number, and this woman answered the phone, Catherine Maldonado. And she said, oh, yeah, I have a problem. Someone's about to take it, but I'll, I'll meet with you anyway, in case he falls through. So I uh, go to her apartment on Grove Street. It's a top floor studio in the 18th building apartment. I looked out from John's apartment. And I, it was a quintessential village gag. It was a cliche. One big room with a fireplace and a kitchen, ivy covered walls, and, and Catherine was elegant. She was in the mid 70s, elegant, really uh, lovely woman for the South. So she had a lovely time, one accent, which I can't even try to do, but I will try. And she talked to me and said, She, and she uh, asked me what I did. I said, Well, I went to Parsons. I went to Parsons too in 1925. So we connected. Then she said, uh, What do you do? I said, I oh, work for the nonprofit. I like to write. Oh, I love writers. I want to love the writer. The person who lived here was a writer. He's moving out. And it turns out the writer there before me was Nicholas Schaffner, who wrote a book of the Complete Beatles. He made it and moved to a house in Grove Court, mm -hmm. right down the block. Mm -hmm. um, but she's, the rent was 450 This is 1979. Mm -hmm. I was making $10,000 a year, I think. So 450 a month was a stretch. I wanted them so badly. I called my dad, my sister's here, you know. My, my dad, he was a character in many ways, but he knew how much I wanted to be here, and I needed a thousand dollars in the first month to rent security. And he came to look at it and said, of course you should take this, and he gave me the money right away. He saw the lease for Catherine. And I moved in, I found out Catherine had met someone right before me and before I moved in. And she said to me, it's 450. I'm on Wall Street, 455, I don't care whatever you want. And she said, I don't want someone like that living here. I don't want someone like you living here. <laughs> in her mind, I was a writer. That's all I was. Um, and she dropped me right to 425, so I'm going to live She would, you know, she was, she was, just, she was land rich and cash poor. So the building was falling apart. Um, and I helped out as up. I am not a handy guy, but I just thought that was the best I can. <laughs> but she, she was a lovely person. And she knew everyone. She moved here in the village. She was from the South, had 
left her family, went to Parsons, went to Paris in 1925, where she met everybody. Mm -hmm. Like, the there, she always, had, we had the dust coming back from the parties, and late at night she'd be away, oh, come in for a glass of wine. And she'd talk about things, oh, yeah, in Paris, I was going to live around that, and then Zelda, she drank so much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she said it was real, she knew these people. You know, when I had dinner with Vita Sackville, the West, it was, she was charming, but she was on so long. She ended up living in Paris, moved on to Kina, and married one of the wealthiest men in the wealthiest families in Argentina. It was the same, Richard Rogers' time, she was in that family. And uh, she left Argentina, Argentina in the late 40s, uh, left her husband, moved back to York, met another man, uh, Mr. Maldonado, and bought 18 Grove Street in the early 50s. And she always said, I paid $18,500. It was only worth 72. <laughs> but I really wanted that house so bad. And uh, 18 Grove itself is a great, I, I did all this research on it. It was built as a one family house in the 1840s, when the Broadway house was there. And it was divided up over the years to you know, apartments. But in the 20s, it was, uh, you know, a lot of radicals lived there. Uh, the film Red was filmed right in front of the house. Mm -hmm. There's a scene, we saw it last night on TV, and there's a scene that they didn't watch by 18 Grove. But, Real, all that, the whole group of John Reed, Max East, all lived in that area. And it was a hotbed of graduate activity, and she was still part of that in some way. She knew all those people, knew some of them. But um, she, she um, would always love to be our writers. And one of her best friends was a poet, and poet is Denise Levitoff, where we showed up for tea, we chat. You know, Denise is a little more, Catherine was very friendly. Denise is a little, a little haunting. That was, that was a tender for but one of my wonderful moments, I'm sitting there reading Pat Conroy's book um, uh, about New York for the moment. The Prince of Time. I'm reading the book, and he describes his sister's apartment in New York City, a corner studio, a window. And I'm looking around, and this is exactly where I am. <laughs> and I go downstairs and ask Catherine, I say, Catherine, you said, oh, Pat lived there in 1971. <laughs> <laughs> It was this great opera, but she had Dylan Thomas, he used to go to the White House, he drank so much. She knew him, but it wasn't dropping names, it was her real life. And my friend Phil met her too, and he remembers some of those great stories of Catherine and the way she talked to people was so wonderful. Um, but the best moment with my with Catherine and her writer was just a couple of months after I moved in, and the book Sophie's Choice just came out, which was an incredible book. One of the few books that miss my subway stop regularly reading that book. And I'm walking home after work one day, and she's in front of the house with a tall, distinguished man with white hair. And she all said, I like you, my friend. She turns to the soul and says, goes, Bill, sense a writer too. <laughs> so for like one nanosecond, Bill and I were at the same level. <laughs> and he asked, she goes, Oh, you're a writer? What are you working on? And I'm trying to work on it. He goes, Keep that. That's what I did. And his widow, Rose Steyer, who just called short her biography, which is really, it's a great, she was really important in her own right. She's a human, is a human, she's 95, lives up in the Vineyard, is a human rights activist. And she was just as important as he was. All the work she did. So I had time to direct her to say, did Bill ever come home and say, I'm going to set up one scene? But when Catherine went to the house, she, had a, she had one son who was born there in the early 50s, her daughter's moved out. But she knew everybody, and um, it was a great place to live. I moved into the studio in 1979, and in 1983, uh, on a trip to Russia, I met Diane, where everybody meets the next wife is on a trip to Russia, of course. <laughs> and, uh, Diane was living in Brooklyn in those days. And she, she was living in Winter Terrace. We should, she should have bought the place, obviously, it was a mm -hmm. railroad flat. But, it never occurred to me, it was bigger than my apartment, you know, when he won Brooklyn, you know, I didn't want to ever go back to Brooklyn. <laughs> 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 didn't want to do it. But so Diane, she had a fellowship to South America in 1986, and when she was done, she came back, moved into our home, our studio, a very small studio. And it was, it was great. We had friends visit us. It was one room with a soft bed and a futon. And, uh, 
think we have a friend who lives here, my friend Ray is here with us. He came to visit us in the Midwest and he came to the farm and he realized that there's no guest room. <laughs> <laughs> and we pulled out the soap bed with the horse. It's like, don't, not even to don't try to carry it out in the little village. And that's how we had guests. And I hope you survived pretty well. <laughs> um, but it was a great place. But Catherine, like I said, was cash, language cash poor. So, Mr. Penny the plumber, I don't know if he's in the village store, so he must have a better found Mr. Penny. He repaired every time he in the village. He must own a house in France, all the money, half a year. It's all half, everything leaked at some point, and he was always fixing something. So I'd come home sometime, then we signed, this, don't worry about the smell, it's just a rat stuck in the basement. <laughs> One, it was a wonderful period, and Diane moved in, and then we got married in 87. And we both had some sort of rage stroke. We decided to move out. We moved uptown for about six months. It was horrible, he said. And Kathy called and said, the parlor floor is available. And before she finished the sentence, we said, we're moving in. <laughs> and we did, and um, we moved in in 80. 88, I guess. And three years later, we had twin daughters. They're both here tonight. I see that in the back. And, uh, you know, we would go from three of us to two of us, three of us, I was in manageable. To go from two tenants to four tenants was a little hairy. And we ended up moving out to Oman Rest, where they had from me. It was an incredible people. And we needed help. We didn't plan really to have kids so soon. We could play on twins and <laughs> had that. And, but the girls moved in the village the first six months of life. They went to St. Vincent's Hospital. And the first parade was Gay Pride. We <laughs> sat in Church Square. It wasn't that crowded. You know, in those days, it was a big parade where, parade where what it is now. Um, we used to go to Halloween Parade where it was yeah. just in the village. And it, it was great. Catherine was aging at that point, but she was still very much confident. She wrote her memoirs and they were read at the Queen Street Cafe. And there was one evening, one afternoon, we had a little, we had a little thing to die for emergency. Nothing serious, we had a little bit of No baby said, we asked Catherine, would you mind watching Carrie for half an hour? Like I said, Catherine was in Argentina and she would even there. One of the families she knew, knew was the Guevara family. And she always talked about the Guevara was a very nice people. But they did not raise their kids. <laughs> she was a wild child. I think we said she. So she gave us that Carrie, who's probably the distinction of the only person here in New York who had the same baby as the Shady Bear had. I love telling that story. Um, but we used to go to Chumley's when it was, you know, sort of us the floor in the back door. And one of the most favorite parts of the village is snowy nights when there were no cars around. But we near the, I guess, the Mounted Police headquarters on the west side. There was a Mounted Police station there. And to hear the clip clop of the horses on the snowy streets, you know, it's in the apartment. This is just at the time, like 1859 or 1890. <laughs> People discussed the Civil War Department, uh, the turn of the century, electric lighting, the pandemic in 1918. All that was discussed in our apartment. And I just loved being there. We left it, it was really hard for me. When we came back, we uh, always visited Catherine. We sometimes stayed with our friend, Roy Epstein. We had a bigger problem with an extra guest room uh, in our pen south. But Catherine, once someone gave us her apartment, she was living, she went down to Argentina, I think, for a month or something. But so gave us her apartment to use, and it was great. So we were at a, we broke and floated a garden, and the parties were wonderful. Um, she passed away in 2004, and I brought her along because I said, well, they did a memorial service for her at St. Luke and Village. She was a big St. Luke's booster. And not long after we did, St. Luke's caught her fire, burned down. And there was a fundraiser where you buy a drink for St. Luke's. Whenever I pay the rent, and you go downstairs and write the check. She was in the other church, the money, I write another check for the I bought more bricks for Jewish, I'd be slapped and it was a beautiful church too, lonely garden, Sundays are open, it's still wonderful. <coughs> she sold the house, well she, she passed away in 2004, her grandson sold, evil grandson of my mind, <laughs> he sold the house and cashed in $5 million or whatever it was. 
And um, I understand it's whoever bought it, you know, I kind of all the great things. It's, they took all the ivy off. It's perfect. It's like a Hollywood set. And about a month or two ago, I looked at the, I just Googled it. There was a article about the interior. It was we get to a brand new one family. It was designed what they call the Wapusabi design. It's a Japanese aesthetic. Looking at the pictures, it looks like a minimalist Japanese warehouse. Like, <laughs> There's not one book in the house in the pictures, not one piece of art. You know, Catholic House was a mess in a good way. It wasn't sloppy, it was, you know, intellectually messy. You always pick up a you know some book from somewhere and she had art on the wall and the table in the living room was the same table we've been in for years because whoever lived there couldn't get it out. It's a lot of the table. Um, but one thing, you know, we always with Diana always talk about Catherine one of these people where she used to hate nostalgia. Things weren't so great. It's a look in the future. So whenever we get, oh, remember this, remember that, or so much better, I would see her and hear her in my mind said, Seth, look to the future. It always changes. This is someone else's reality. It's not, it wasn't perfect. It will always be different, and that's a good thing. And it really helps me quite a bit. And you know, come down to this area, other areas of the city that we get nostalgia for, for things that. It would want that to be the killing. So, um, but the village will always be here. I'm so glad I can part this with Nina and Maya and Chloe and all of you. And uh, I spoke with Al, so I think we're ready for Q and A. Did you always intend that, or did you write it chronologically and later chop it up? Um, no, I wrote, that's how I wrote it. The, uh, past, present, past, present. I didn't, I didn't go back. I just write in the, pre, in the, the prologue takes place many years ago. First chapter's present, and then I did that. So I, I, that's how I did, I did it all chronologically. I went back and did lots of rewrites, but I wrote present, past, present, past. Well, it's a long, as you can see, it. if you don't like it, it's a good door stop poster. <laughs> um, it's, it's a pretty heavy book. Who is your favorite bartender in Greenwich Village? You know, my favorite bartender, you know, I don't really have any favorites. Um, I, I, I drink more now than I did then, I think. I don't drink a lot, but I didn't, you know, I didn't have any money. I just got martinis when I was in my 40s, which is a good thing because they're very expensive. I mean, you know, but I used to love margaritas, and you know, in the book I talk about, um, you know, there's a, a running thing about the worst restaurants in New York City that serve the biggest portions of the cheapest prices. The Pachitos is definitely up there. The worst things of food but big portions of the cheap prices. The restaurants of all hot, which is still terrible food that I love. And um, the Puglia, which I think closed in the movie. But I, I think we're good. But 
when I was in my theater days, we used to hang out at, it was a bar on 6th Avenue and 14th Street, The Muse. It was either spelled M-E-W-S or M-U-S. E, then what match put the hand that week? <laughs> 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 How long did it take to write the book? Uh, you know, the idea has probably been in my brain for years. I mean, going back 10 years or so, maybe longer. I met with, I was a character who works for Legal Aid, and my friends here from Legal Aid, I know that for lunch at least 10 years ago, talking about what Legal Aid was like. But really, getting to write it, seeing the other vision. 2020, 21, I really started working on it. It was about two years. The first draft I showed today in, uh, in April of 2021, and my first person I wanted to see was her, and my best critic, and she said, I like this, but, and she did all the reasons that things didn't work. She got really fixed, and except for one, I fixed them all. <laughs> Um, are there any ideas floating around in your brain for a sequel? Um, I'm there, there always are. There always are. Yeah. You know, it's great getting the feedback from this. Because, like I said, it's a character novel. And there are a lot of characters that have developed, but some I think I can do more with. And I'm waiting to hear what the feedback is. I may measure some of you. Know, you know, people, some people love my main character. I think it's kind of Scatterbrain, a little crazy. I said, getting different ideas to people helps. But there's a couple of characters I'd like to play with some more. I'm always thinking that. You know, I, my, the writing process for me is I go to bed, lay in bed, could sleep for a while, think about what comes next in the story. And then I wake up the next day, oh, that's all terrible, you know. <clears throat> and then a lot of writers, I write something, go back, and how do I write this? This is great. <laughs> <laughs> I managed to get through with a lot of help, and a lot of people. Um, it's not a lot, but that seven or eight people read the whole thing and gave me some very good feedback. Um, it was much too I said to the editor, it was much too long. I think this is a good thing, but it, was, it would have been like botanic. <laughs> overwrote things. Other good advice I heard from a friend, a good critic, you know, a good friend will say, it won't be, oh, it's a little bit, you know. And I have a friend who said, I like it, but. 25% has got to go. You're underestimating your reader. You don't need to tell them everything. You will apply things, you don't need to spoon feed them. They're smart. They'll figure it out, and it's absolutely right. Well, I'll go back to um, I, I, I really enjoyed hearing the excerpt and especially some of the references to things like Murray's cheese or you know, the very specific uh, references to the village. Um, and then hearing you talk about kind of nostalgia and your time living here in the 70s to, to 90s. Um, and I'm curious to hear just a little bit more about how that maybe informed what made it into the book about the neighborhood and this idea of you know, looking ahead instead of looking back and did you did you find yourself kind of thinking back to your time here and did that make its way directly into the novel or was it more of like a secondary? Yeah, I think you know, the theme of the novel, you know, there was a theme and then figured out after I got in the end, but you know, the past is something we always have, doesn't change. And you know, you have to remember it's the past and how we move on forward. Just like the village, like Catherine said, you know, the past is great, but don't. You know, in the past, you know, it's, a, it's not a residence, it's a memory. You know, remember, don't reside there. And that's really important. And it's hard to do that sometimes. We, the village was great. It was great things happened to be there. And then my wife, I had my share of children. Um, we made great friends and we're still friendly with people who I learned so much from. And uh, it was a village, you know, we were wonderful. Do you happen to know, on the way here, I walked by 17 Grove, which is one of the best preserved colonial houses. The wooden house. The wooden house, yes. which is kitty corner from Catherine's. Yes, yes. Do you happen to know anything about the history of that house? Yeah. We moved there in 19, when I moved there in 1979, it was a run-down shack. And behind it was the works, a workhouse. Everybody said that was a slave place. From what I understand, it was the workshop for the, the wooden house was a sash house in 1830s, possibly. 
the village, as you know, well, some of you know, but maybe you don't, some of was a suburb of downtown Manhattan. People moved here in the 1820s when these were these yellow fever epidemic, and they moved to the village to get away from the terrible slums of downtown. So that's all the streets are, the streets are 18th century, 17th century cow pass. So if you were a lot of 17th century cow, you get around, otherwise it's kind of hard. But um, it's, you know, it was, it was in suburbs, sort of neighborhood. But this whole thing, the houses were built in. Grove Street, the Roy House that I was on, was built in the 1840s. And Grove Court, which is now very expensive, was where the poor people lived, moving mm -hmm. back. Huh. Now it's more expensive. But that little wooden house, I believe, was a, a sash maker's house, a little maker's house, and the back was the workshop. When we moved in, when I moved in first, then, not for another four or five years, it was run down like a bloody house and had been painted in years. And that was built by Ken, who was the son of Barbie, Barbie Ken? Oh, the creator. The son of the, son of the fa I forget the last name. Ken Hansler? Yeah. 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 He was <laughs> He bought the house. He was a rich guy with a trust fund. He bought the house and restored it. Beautiful. <coughs> I think he died relatively young, unfortunately. I don't know who lives in now, but it was a run down house. Just like Twin Peaks, when your friend John lived there, it was run down as a rental. We have a co op, and now it's fancy. And, yeah. We were actually just researching that in village preservation to figure out the connect any connection between Barbie and the village. <laughs> it's so popular right yeah. now. Uh, it was Ken Hamlin who bought that house. It must have been in the mid 80s because it was it's a small house and it was at like, like four palms in it, like one reach. And the Twin Peaks house, John told me I was sure in the 19 teens or something. Walt Disney and John Barrymore, maybe I'm forgetting the details, but the story of Walt Disney and John Barrymore roommates living there in the 20s. I don't know if it's true or not. But like a lot of stories, things change a lot. <laughs> you can tell for you don't know. Um, but the Pink Tea Cup was at the corner for a long time. That was the jazz, all the black jazz musicians went there for meals. Even in the village, some restaurants were in the plant. The Pink Tea Cup was always a place to go. For breakfast, and we were still there until the end. It ain't moved around a bit, but it was there when we did. Yeah. Can't believe Channel Catherine not be too nostalgic, but the reality it was that it moved to Grove Street. It was the bank of the Blumstein Hardware on Grove on Lincoln Street. Blumstein. Blumstein Blumstein Hardware. You know that store. Everybody in the village went there, and they made a fortune on you know screwdrivers and everything else. And they were great. And then it was like a bakery, which is, you know, it had some better, made, made with butter. No way. Catherine's in the South, and she was, it's all made with lard. I know my lord. <laughs> <laughs> she was right, it wasn't very good, but it was still a good taste. <laughs> that was the point of the leaker, the seventh day of good. It was in the oil, was nice. A short squat, and we said, hey, French fry. And he was really nice, but the food was good. It always looked look good, but it didn't taste that good. <laughs> But there was A, P was there, and then there was Steve and else. It's easy to buy a Rolex watch sometimes and just to buy a loaf of bread. And it will stop being Great, well, I think we have time for one or two more questions, if there are any. Hey, Seth, what's, what was the difference when you wrote the plays years ago on a typewriter versus writing a book today digital? It digital. is so much better to do digital. <laughs> it is. Um, you know, you can make changes and sit in that second. It's the greatest thing. You know, I, but we didn't know, you know, I did typewriter because it's better than my handwriting was always terrible. Uh, I had a lengthy typewriter, but you know, working on a computer and cut and paste and revising is the best thing in the world. And I did a lot of good writing and rewriting. And I did a lot of rewrites. I write to the evening, come back next morning and say, This is really terrible. How could I do this? <laughs> But I love working online. It's great. But now it scares me is AI. Really scary. About a month ago, my friend Lionel, who's an Israel American reality, and he's a tech expert on the big company out there. And I, was, I don't know much about AI, and he's really good at it. It's amazing what he can do. So he said, type in, I am the New York Times best selling author, writing a book about young men in Paris. And went to Israel and came back to you. You know, just general, give me a plot outline. 
He never says, I got something, something in my foot. <laughs> it was really crazy. This is like five seconds. And I said, how the hell did that happen? He said, it scared the entire internet. Found a notebook somewhere with other books. And there it is. So I can see why writers want to strike. It's very scary. But I, I, I don't know how that would be controlled. I mean, there are moments I think, I wish I thought about that when I had some problems in school. <laughs> 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 but, you know, this is a very rare what you say. Um, yeah, that's scary. The technology is great, but on the other hand, we've got to figure out how to make it work for us, not take it over us.